Good morning, ladies. My name is Dina Clark. If you're new with us today, welcome to our study of Acts. But I want to give you a little bit of background before we start today in our chapters, because the events that um, happen today in the study, in the chapters we're looking at, actually began in Acts 21. So as a quick review, this is what happened. Um, that in Acts 21, it was when it was prophesied over Paul that if he went to Jerusalem, he would be bound by the Jews and handed over to the Gentiles. And of course, we know Paul did that anyway. And it was there that Paul um, in Jerusalem was advised to join some Jewish men in purification vow to show that he wasn't anti-Jewish. And um, at the temple, some opposing Jews from Asia recognized him, stir up a riot, and they're ready to kill him. And the Roman commander stops that from happening. Well, then in Acts 22, Paul requested to speak um, to the crowd, but instead of arguing for his defense, what he does instead is he uses it as an opportunity to testify to Jesus Christ, to his people. Um, things go really great until he mentions uh, preaching to the Gentiles, and that is when the Jewish people lose their minds and demand that he be taken away and not be allowed to live the commander, again, the Roman commander, is taking him to be questioned and beaten, because that's what they do. And he mentions, by the way, did I tell you I'm a Roman citizen? So that kind of stops that in its tracks. Then, last week, we looked at ch chapter 23, where Paul is taken before the Sanhedrin, which you'll remember is the Jewish religious governing body. And that time with them really spirals down until some of the Jews are ready to take an oath to have him murdered. Um, in his cell... That is when the Lord appears to Paul, telling him to take courage and promising him that he would indeed testify in Rome. So Paul's nephew, meanwhile, overhears about this plot to have him murdered. He tells the Roman commander. Then Paul is moved under armed escort to Caesarea to the governor to hear his case. So today we're in chapter 24 and in 25 of Acts. The title for today's lesson is Power Through Trials, Part 1. And uh, spoiler alert, next week is Power Through Trials, Part 2, because at this point, Beth and I had run out of our creative juices. You're welcome. <laughs> so will you pray with me before we begin? Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your presence inside each of us. I pray for your presence in this room. I thank you for your presence in your word. So I pray that right now you will speak, that we will have the same sensation that Paul did, that you have stood beside us today and you have spoken words to us. Will we help us to hear what you're saying to our hearts and how you would have us move out in your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, so as we begin chapter 24 in Acts, Paul has arrived in Caesarea and is under guard. So I'm going to read to you verse 1. Five days later, the high priest Ananias... Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. Now, this first verse shows us who Paul is up against. Ananias, the um, Jewish high priest and the Jewish elders, they have all made the journey to the court of Felix in Caesarea. The Jewish leadership is very serious about convicting Paul and getting him out of the picture. They actually hired a very skilled lawyer named Tertullus, who was speaking for them before the judge. So Felix is the Roman governor of Judea and Samaria, and he is the one who's going to preside, preside over the case against Paul. Now, Felix began life as a slave, but his brother was actually friends with the emperor, and through that relationship and some intrigue or whatever, he actually gained his freedom as a child. Um, and he became the first former slave to become a governor of a Roman province. However, he, historians say that he never really lost his slave mentality. One historian, um, Roman historian, described Felix as a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a slave, excuse me, the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. So he was very brutal and corrupt in his administration, and he was actually hated by the Jews. Verses 2 through 4. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix. We acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So first of all, this is lies that are just wrapped up in flattery. 
It's a courtroom tactic. Felix did not bring peace or prosperity to those he governed. And the Sanhedrin that's bringing this case to him, um, that governing body of religious and spiritual issues for the Jewish people, they hated Felix. The Jewish leadership was not above the sin of flattery because to win their case, they felt like they had to win their judge. Now, there's nothing wrong with complimenting others. Flattery is different. It, can be motiv it is motivated by what is to be gained, and flattery doesn't even really care if what's being said is true or not. Jude 1.16 in the New Living Translation says, These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. See, a compliment is meant for the good of the recipient. Flattery is meant for the good of the flatterer. And Tertullus flatters Felix in order to gain favor in court. Now, the Jews are going to have three charges that they bring before Paul. Let's read about them. They're in verses 5 through 9. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. A quick note, you may notice in your Bible that there is no verse 7 that skips to verse 8. Um, that is because in most modern translations, it is not found and um, they've left it out because they, it's not in the most reliable and earliest Greek trans, uh, manuscripts. So that you may find a footnote about that in your Bible, just to explain that. So verse 8, by examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation asserting that these things were true. Now, to be clear, the Roman government cares very little about religious matters. They just wanted to keep at bay anyone and anything that would stir up trouble in the empire. Um, kind of like a mom that has a lot of kids, and by the end of the day, you no longer care about justice. You just want quiet. Like, <laughs> give him the toy. You know, that kind of, that's how they were about this. That's, they really didn't care, but it's all about keeping things settled and quiet. Now, what is the Jewish leadership charging Paul with? The first is a charge against his character. They call him a troublemaker. Now, um, the Greek word there means actually pest or plague. Paul was a plague to the Jewish leadership, an infectious spreading disease. And Tertullus is trying to convince Felix that he could be a plague to Rome as well, suggesting if that he frees Paul, he's going to let this contagion of um, turmoil and disorder and just unrest and rebellion throughout the whole empire. The Jewish leaders did hate Paul, but his, Paul's ultimate enemy, who is behind all this, Satan wants Paul to shut up. He is a pest and a plague to Satan's plans, and you and I should be too. Point number one, be a plague to Satan, his kingdom, and his plans. Be a plague. To Satan, his kingdom, and his plans. Now, as Christ followers, in and of ourselves, we actually have no power over Satan, but... We have the power of Christ in us. Scripture tells us that we actually have the same power that raised Jesus from death to life, available and inside of us. Now, Revelation tells us how it ends for Satan. And in Romans 16, 20, we find out that it's going to be God who crushes Satan, but he ends up under our feet. Until then, let's get under his skin. Be a thorn in the side of the devil and his destructive plans and his um, destructive forces. I love this quote by an um, author named Joanne Clancy. She said, be the kind of woman who, when your feet hit the floor each morning, the devil says, oh no, she's up. <laughs> <laughs> so the second charge is that Paul is politically dangerous. He's the ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Now, Paul follows Jesus, but you'll notice that they do not want to use Jesus' name. They call him the Nazarene. There was actually a term of scorn uh, Nazareth had a very poor reputation as a city. You may remember back when um, Jesus was beginning his earthly ministry, and um, Philip goes and tells Nathaniel, like, we found him. We found the one the scriptures talk about. Come and see. And he says to him, he calls Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, 
son of Joseph. And Nathanael responds in John 1, 46, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So that's kind of reputation the city had. So Tertullus uses the word Nazarene on purpose. He uses the word sect on purpose as well because it suggests heresy. And he uses the word ringleader because it has the same negative overtones to them as it does to you and me. A ringleader is a person who initiates or leads an illicit or illegal activity. Bible studies don't have ringleaders. Crime syndicates have ringleaders. So that's why he's using this word. So now Rome gave the Jews freedom to practice their religion, but only if the privileges that they gave them didn't um, weaken the empire. So this charge is a little more serious than the first because it was illegal to establish a religion in Rome without the approval of the authorities. And if they could prove that Paul was a ringleader of a sect, they would be able to build a case against him that the governor would be motivated to deal with. The third is a doctrinal charge. They accuse Paul of, ha of trying to desecrate the temple. Now, Roman law gave special status and protection to the Jewish temple at this time. This was actually the mob's accusation of, against Paul back in Acts 21. This charge is based on the rumor of those people that are not even there to testify at this courtroom in Caesarea. Verse 9 tells us that the high priests and the elders agree with the charges, but they can offer no evidence. Why? It's slander. They must have forgotten, oh, I don't know, the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not testify falsely against your neighbor. Okay, so let's go verses 10 through 13 in chapter 24. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. First of all, I have to tell you, I just love this because Paul will not flatter Felix. He says, you've been a judge for a while. That's what I can say truthfully about you. That is all he says. He doesn't flatter him. He doesn't say he's great at what his job is. So he continues. He says, you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. So Paul points out that this entire thing didn't even happen that long ago and that these charges should not be that hard to prove. There were many witnesses to him being there in Jerusalem, to him being there in the temple, and yet there are no witnesses here to back up their claims. Paul continues in verse 14 through 21, However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and it's written um, in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Real quickly, just to, in case that confuses you at all, there was a, um, a belief at the time, and probably still may be, that the unrighteous, the unsaved, the people who don't follow God and for Christians don't follow Jesus, that they disappear when they die, that they just cease to be. But Paul very clearly believes in a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, this is a statement about the end times. And actually, Jesus taught about it in Matthew 25, 46. He says something about this. And it's actually in the Old Testament, too, which would have been their scriptures that they had at the time. That um, both the saved and the unsaved will get up, that will be resurrected and be judged. For example, in Daniel 2, excuse me, Daniel 12, verse 2, in the New Living Translation, it says, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. So I just wanted to explain that sentence to you real quickly. Okay, so verse 16, so I strive always to keep my conscience, this is Paul still talking, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor, and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowds with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Those would be the, um, the Asian Jews that started the riot back in Acts 21. 
or these who are here should state what crime they found me in before, when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So Paul answers to the charges. First of all, I'm not a troublemaker. I was in Jerusalem for six days. There was no crowds around me. There, I wasn't debating any groups. I wasn't lecturing anyone. I was in the temple because I was worshiping the same God that these men profess to worship. Secondly, I'm not a ringleader of a sect. I'm a follower of the way. He stresses the similarities between his beliefs and his accusers' beliefs. Paul doesn't worship a different God, but he worshiped the same God of their fathers in a new and different way. He didn't see himself as a former Jew. He saw himself as a fulfilled Jew. William Montgomery Boyce says, Paul would have argued that following Jesus was not a deviation from Judaism, but rather true Judaism itself. So Paul points out that he's not abandoned God, he's not abandoned the law or the prophets, that the way is the fulfillment of those things. Jesus is the one that the Old Testament was pointing to. That's what he kept trying to tell everybody. Tertullus calls it a sect. Paul calls it the way. He will not let the enemy define who he is or who he worships. Point number two, do not allow the enemy to define you or who you worship. Do not allow the enemy... To define you or who you worship. Do not allow the enemy to define you or who you worship. The enemy defines Paul as a troublemaker, a pest, and a plague, and a ringleader. But Paul knows who he is because he knows whose he is. We do not listen to the enemy tell us who we are or who our God is because it will all be either twisted truth or all in out lies. Thirdly, Paul says, I didn't desecrate the temple. I was delivering an offering for the Jerusalem poor from the Gentile churches that I established. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple. The Sanhedrin that wasn't even present, they can't testify as eyewitnesses. It was actually the Jews from Asia that were there that raised um, all these charges, and they're not here to testify. In verse 21, he says, is the possibly the only thing that the Sanhedrin could testify against him, which might be a little holy tongue and cheek. He says, if, basically, if I've done anything, it's probably this. I reminded the Jewish council of our great Jewish doctrine of resurrection. Now, you remember when Beth taught, she was telling us that on, in the Sanhedrin there were Members who were Pharisees, who believed in the resurrection. There were members who Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, and that was what caused some of the ruckus. Verse 16, though, he said, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, to strive means to exercise oneself by training or discipline, to take pains, practice, or train. So Paul is saying he purposely goes after a clear conscience, first before God, then before man. Point number three, strive to live with a clear conscience before God and man in that order. Strive to live with a clear conscience before God and man in that order. In 1 Peter 3.16, in the message translation, it says, Keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. <laughs> Paul doesn't seek to offend man. He lives with a clear conscience before God and then before man. And we're actually going to see a very stark contrast in Felix as we continue. So verses 22 through 23 in Acts 24. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he says, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Now, we can only imagine the ministry that went on in those meetings as these friends would come to visit him and minister to him and the seeds that he planted and then sent out all throughout the city. Now, Paul has a clear conscience before God 
and then before man. But Felix knows Paul is innocent, but he wants a clear conscience before man. He doesn't want to upset the Jews, so he decides to put off deciding. He avoids a political decision, and in these following verses, he's going to avoid a spiritual one, which is even more tragic. Verses 24 through 25, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Now, Felix was a pagan, and his wife, Drusilla, was raised as a Jew, although she wasn't a practicing Jew at the time. Um, Drusilla was beautiful, she was ambitious, and she was about 20 years old when this is going down. Felix had seduced her away from her first husband and made her his third wife, a fact that very likely informed Paul's sermon topics. You see that he spoke on, they're summed up for us in those verses as righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, we don't know exactly how he developed these points, but we can guess they went something like this, that he explained to them that righteousness is being made right with God. That righteousness is um, a requirement by God, that God is holy and he demands perfect holiness. Point number four, what God demands, he provides through his son. What God demands... He provides through his son. What God demands, he provides through his son. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The New Living Translation says it this way, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God provides the righteousness he requires. Self-control was another sermon topic. Self-control is a virtue <clears throat> of one who masters his desires and passions. Self-control was lacking in the life of both Felix and Drusilla. They had followed their passions and their relationship into his third marriage and her second. Felix followed his passions as a leader. He didn't hesitate to um, lie or to murder Paul had spoken um, in verse 24 about faith in Christ Jesus. He had shared the gospel and the way to that perfect righteousness and the way to the power for true self-control. In Galatians 5.23, self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Point number five, self-control is fruit of a life led by the Holy Spirit. Self-control is fruit... of a life led by the Holy Spirit. Self-control is fruit led, excuse me, of a life led by the Holy Spirit. When I was showing Beth this, she goes, well, you know why self-control is last on the fruit of the Spirit list, because it's the hardest to get. I was like, that might be true. Okay, so he also spoke about the judgment to come which was their accountability before God. Paul wasn't afraid to talk about the judgment of God to come. In his sermon back in Acts 17, you may remember he was speaking to the people of Athens. In Acts 17, 31, he said, For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead, speaking of Jesus. So Paul knew that in order to understand the good news, you had to understand the bad news. You will face judgment. You deserve judgment, but your judge is actually your rescuer and has paid your penalty if you will accept it. Our sixth point is actually a quote from Warren Wiersbe. Point number six, Jesus Christ is either your savior or your judge. Jesus Christ is either your savior or your judge. Jesus Christ is either your savior or your judge. 
understand this, every sin that you have committed, every sin that has been committed by you, for you, towards you, is going to get paid for. And it will either be paid for by the person or it's going to be paid for by Jesus. Tertullus knew that to win your case, you had to win your judge. And we have won ours. The blood of Christ has purchased our victory. So Paul delivered the truth to Felix and Drusilla with straightforward boldness. He diagnosed Felix's case, and he actually provided him with a cure. And it would be up to Felix to receive it. Felix responds to Paul's message, but not in repentance and belief, but fear. And he sends Paul away and avoids the most important decision of his life. It tells us in the scripture that we just read that Felix was well acquainted with the way. He knew of Jesus intellectually. He probably could have told us a whole lot of stuff about Jesus. But he never knew him spiritually, and he never knew him relationally as his Lord and Savior. He knew the facts about Christ, was even moved emotionally, and he even talked about him frequently. As we see in verse 26, he called Paul to him frequently, but it was not enough. He was never moved to acceptance and, repent, and repentance and acceptance of Christ as his Savior. Felix was well acquainted with the way. Drusilla, Drusilla was raised as a Jew. She knew the God he spoke of. They had seen the light, but they chose to live in darkness. Jesus said in John 3, 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So Acts 24, verses 26 to 27, at the same time, he, Felix, was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and because Felix wanted to grant favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Felix's heart, Felix's heart motives are revealed a little bit here as greed. He was hoping that eventually Paul was going to wear down and offer him a bribe. And it was also the fear of man. He wanted to grant a favor to the Jews. Felix knew Paul was innocent, but he was more concerned with the political advantage more motivated by a clear conscience before man than before God. Paul, however, did not suffer from fear of man, clearly. So this intimidating group that accused him and this powerful man that had the absolute authority to judge him did not scare him silent. Paul knew that he, point number seven, human approval is a God substitute. Human approval is a God substitute. Human approval is a God substitute. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe, is kept safe. The New Living Translation says it this way, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. So Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews which means to lay up favor for oneself, to gain favor with. He wanted man's approval. Fear of man is an idol, and it's an idol that Felix bowed down to so much he would not make a decision about Paul's case, and more tragically, he would not make a decision about following Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that we are to seek to offend man, that we are need to seek human, um, to you know, disobey human authority just to prove a point. But that we do look to God for our identity and our value, and we work from there to be salt and light, to be messengers of reconciliation. And then human rejection, though it may hurt, it will not destroy us because our identity isn't built on it. Paul is slandered by men, and not just any men, they're his own people. But his security and identity and assurance or in his Savior's acceptance. Human approval is a God substitute, and fully living requires just God approval, and God accepted in Christ, it's already ours. Ephesians 1, 6 in the King James Version says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Felix puts off deciding about Paul for two years, and he passes this issue on to his successor, Festus, these names, right? Am I right? I feel like I'm reading a Dr. Seuss book. Okay, <laughs> Festus is the new judge now. Felix was undoubtedly a very bad man, but history actually tells us that Festus was a pretty good guy. Mm 
He governed well, despite all the problems left to him by Felix, and he doesn't waste any time once he comes into office. He very quickly travels to Jerusalem, as we're about to read, and that would have been because it was a very important city in his province. So we're now in chapter 25. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing to ambush and ambush to kill him along the way. It's been two years, and the religious leaders have not cooled their jets in their anger toward Paul. And they're hoping that Festus would agree to bring Paul back to Jerusalem for trial. Why? So they could murder him on the way. They were worried Paul would be acquitted. And they thought, let's just take care of him, plot to kill him before the trial even happens. And again, just let that sink in. These are the Jewish religious leaders. The Jewish religious leaders are accusing Paul, and they're hypocrites, and their religion is a veneer that they are using as an excuse to do evil, claiming God's authority for their disobedience. And as Van has often said to us, religion without Jesus makes people mean. All right, chapter 25, verses 4 through the beginning of 6. Festus answered, Paul is being held in Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me. And if the man was done, has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. And after spending 8 or 10 days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. So Festus says no to their request for a change of venue for the trial, which is another way that God protected Paul, as we can see. Unlike Felix, Festus, though, wants to deal with this um, quickly, so he reopens the trial in Caesarea. And we're told about it in very brief language, but from what has been said in chapter 24 and the way that Paul will respond in Acts 25 8, the charges were very likely heresy. He was accused of doing something contrary to God's law, sacrilege, again, against the temple, and treason against Caesar. And since the burden of proof is on his accusers, and they have none, Paul simply denies the charges. Chapter 25, end of verse 6 and verse, two, eight, verse 8. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. In response, Paul very confidently rested in both the evidence, or we should say the lack thereof, and his integrity. Festus was quick to bring the issue back to court, but his flaw was that he too wanted to please the people and show the Jews favor. Verse 9 says, Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, um, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Now, Festus actually could not demand that the trial be moved to Jerusalem because Paul was a Roman citizen. So we asked him, you know, what do you think about this? And Paul gave that suggestion a hard pass. As David Guzik said this, he said, Paul wasn't afraid to face the lions, but he didn't want to put his head in the lion's mouth if he could avoid it. So Paul realizes too, we're just going around in circles here. This whole thing started in Jerusalem. I've spent two years waiting for trial in Caesarea, and now you want me to go back to Jerusalem? We're not getting anywhere. Verse, chapter 25, verses 10 through 12, Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I've done, I've done, have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by the Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. Now, Paul appeals to Caesar, which um, was his right as a Roman citizen, and his, probably at this point his, he thinks the only hope to get a fair trial, or just get a trial, get someone to actually make a decision. Now, this is a, basically an appeal to a Supreme Court in the Roman Empire. And this way, Paul would stay under Roman protection because they would have to be the ones to get him to Rome. Uh, meanwhile, Festus asked um, for some help from King Agrippa, who is in town. Now, this encounter that we will begin to read today actually goes through Acts 26, which Beth will, begin, will finish teaching next week, but it starts here. So this is Acts 25, verses 13, and the first half of 14. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice 
arrived in Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. And since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Now, Herod Agrippa II was part of that entire Herod dynasty that we read about all through the New Testament. Um, they were a long list of rulers that were appointed by Rome to oversee Israel. This Agrippa's great-grandfather was the one that tried to have baby Jesus killed. His grandfather was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. And his father had martyred the first apostle, James. Now, compared to his ancestors, Agrippa was actually a pretty good king. See, uh, well, I know compared to them, right? Uh, so Herod Agrippa II was known to be an expert in Jewish customs and in religious matters. The emperor had given him the right to oversee the affairs of the temple and the um, appointment of the high priest. So he did not have jurisdiction in Paul's case. He couldn't you know, rule for him, but he did have a lot of um, information and kind of backstory to the Jewish religious ways. So that's why Festus hoped he might be able to give him some insight. Because here's the deal. Festus has agreed to send Paul to Rome, to send him to Caesar, but he's in a little bit of a bind now. What exactly is Paul accused of? that substantiates sending him to a higher court. He thinks that Agrippa will be able to help him find the real charges against Paul. So chapter 25, end of verse 14 through 22, Festus says, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders in, of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it was not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they'd face their accusers and have the opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him over their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. So I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. So Festus is surprised at the accusations against Paul that they revolve around matters of religion in verse 19, a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. You know, it sounds ridiculous when you say it like that, right? And I can see him almost shrugging his shoulders like this entire thing started because of some dead guy that Paul, cuckoo, thinks is alive. You know, it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. It's fantasy. And that is how the world and our enemy may try to define our faith. Do not let them. Point number eight, do not allow the enemy to define your faith. Do not allow the enemy to define your faith. Do not allow the enemy to define your faith. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Acts 25.19 shows that Paul was defending more than resurrection in general. He was declaring and defending the resurrection of Jesus. Now, in order to talk about his resurrection, he'd have to talk about his death. In order to talk about his death, He's going to have to talk about the cross. And Agrippa's curiosity meant that Paul would have another opportunity to share the gospel. God was fulfilling his promise to Paul that he would be a witness before kings. Remember back when Paul was being called in Acts 9.15, the New Living Translation says, Jesus said, my, Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as the people of Israel. Now, back in Luke's gospel, he recorded Jesus' words that he had spoken to some of his disciples in Luke 21, 12 through 13. And I just feel certain that Luke shared them with Paul and encouraged him with these words from our Lord and Savior. Luke 21, 12 through 13, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand before trial, stay in trial before kings and governors because you are my followers but this will be your opportunity to tell them 
about me. Now, I'm not sure, but looking out at your faces, I'm pretty sure that it's unlikely that any of us have ever been drugged before an earthly court to make a defense of our faith and our actions. But here's the deal. Every single follower of Christ is the target of accusations from our enemy, Satan. Revelation 12, 10 calls Satan the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. Relentless. And here's saying our accuser is not above using false ac accusations, slander, lies. <coughs> Jesus is our example of what to do when we're under trials like that. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23 in the New Living Tr Translation for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is our example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. And here's the thing. Our accuser will use very valid and true accusations as well. Satan is not above bringing up our past sins and failings and throwing in our face the very thing that he tempted us to do. But here's the thing. They are no longer evidence against us. They have been paid for, they have been dealt with, and they aren't even on our rap sheet. Romans 8, 33 through 34 in the New Living Translation, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen as his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Jesus Christ died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Our last point for today, point number nine, in Christ, even your sins aren't evidence against you. In Christ, even your sins. If you want to make it personal, write my sins. Even my sins aren't evidence against me. In Christ, even your sins aren't evidence against you. That's mind-blowing. This week is, and next week, are about the power through trials. In closing, I want you to join me in using our sanctified imagination, just to pull down this point and really put it firmly in our hearts. I want you to imagine that you're on trial in a heavenly courtroom and that you are standing behind a defense table. The judge walks in and God in all of his glory sits to decide your fate. The prosecutor stands and it's Satan and he begins to read the charges against you. And as he does, you realize with this sinking feeling that every single thing that he is saying is actually true. And all you plan to do when he's finished talking is plead guilty. But then you notice who's standing beside you, your defense attorney. Jesus Christ. And as Satan reads a very true and accurate decision, Jesus raises his holy hand and looks at the Father and says, I died for that one. And God takes his holy gavel and bangs it. Next charge. And Satan reads another one. And Jesus says, I died for that one too. Next charge. And on and on and on it can go. I don't care what that charge is. That affair, that abortion, that one thing that Jesus is some, I mean that Satan has somehow convinced you is the one thing that Jesus' blood did not pay for. Do not let the accuser define you. Your God or your faith. Believe that what God demands, he, he absolutely graciously supplies for us. He provides it for us. And that in Christ, even our sins are not evidence against us. Because here's what I believe with all my heart. A woman who knows that, who truly knows that in her heart and her head, who walks and lives that truth, she will be a plague to Satan and his plans. And she will live a full life here and with him. Will you pray with me? Father, whatever, whatever has stirred up in our hearts right now, is the thing that for some reason we've allowed Satan to convince us that we got to keep telling you we're sorry. 
pray that right now with your power of your Holy Spirit, that you do the work in our hearts and our head that you've already done in our lives. And that you'll show us that we are your beloved, that we are forgiven, and that that charge is no longer on our rap sheet. And I pray in that power that we have, we will go out and be a plague to who Satan is in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our world, and make him sorry that we got up this morning. Thank you that you love us so much, that you give us so much, and that you never, ever let us go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For next week, we read Acts 25, 23 through the rest of the chapter and then all of chapter 26 through verse 32.